from Sankara as condition arises conditioned consciousness. With the cessation of Sankara, conditioned consciousness ceases. Namaste. So this episode is going to be about the relationship between Sankara and consciousness. By consciousness, we mean conditioned consciousness, not uh, the consciousness of an enlightened being, but the consciousness of someone who thinks they are the various phenomena <laughs> in the aggregate making up what they consider their self. So, yeah, it's complicated. <laughs> And as long as consciousness is established on something outside, on something phenomenal, something in the world, like thoughts, feelings, the body, or a sense of identity and so on, it's going to be conditioned. So let's get into it. What does the Buddha say? The very term Sankhara, has connotations of deception and spuriousness. In other words, it's not real. In ancient Vedic culture, Sankara, the term, had to do with the costumes, makeup, staging, and other dramatic uh, tools used in the presentation of temple dramas. So in other words, it's something made up. It's something artificial. It's not natural. It doesn't come by itself. But it's something that we do to present a false image. Just like a play. That's why we compared it in the past. Uh, the ignorance that is at the root of Sankara is like a movie show. It's just like a play. It's on a stage, <laughs> the stage is ignorance, and the whole theater is blacked out. And so the attention is focused on the actors, which are the thoughts in the mind. And because of the costumes and so on, they're very attractive, and we think that they're real, but they're not. So Sankara, as we went over in our previous series on Sankara, they can be bodily, verbal, or mental. And a good example of bodily sankara is breathing. Breathing in and out. And verbal, of course, is our speech. Because basically all the definitions of our words are made up. And mental sankara are the thoughts especially the plans and expectations, what we're going to do in the future, the imaginary future. <laughs> so another role of Sankaras that's very important in the mind is to sustain the vortex, uh, the whirling around, the spin, <laughs> especially between consciousness and name and form. And we're going to go into that deeply in future episodes. I think it's going to take several episodes to cover that adequately. It's a deep subject. But this spin begins already because Sankara are a deception. Huh? What is a deception? It's a turning about, isn't it? To, to fake somebody out, you pretend you're going to go this way, but then you go over here instead. And this is considered, you know, a very good tactic in sports and in war. But we do it to ourselves when we adopt a false identity through the creation of sankhara, or sometimes called preparations or fabrications. So this is why we have to watch out and be conscious of or aware of the actions of sankhara in our own minds. So because we don't understand the relationship between Sankara and consciousness. Huh? This is actually ignorance. And the, the spinning around, the, the, the periodic alternation between different states of consciousness 
different states of mind. Huh? For example, every day we go through Jagrat consciousness, waking consciousness, and then sleep, dreaming sleep, Svapna, and then deep sleep, Sushupta. And if we're so fortunate as to be able to meditate, then we can reach Turiya. Huh? These are all different states of consciousness. They're all basically phony. The real thing is that all these states are available at once. When we get to that stage, then we're beyond. <laughs> so the problem is that we don't understand how we are deceiving ourselves, how we're fooling ourselves, how we're putting on a false mask. And that is also avidya, that's also ignorance. Huh? And in that darkness of ignorance, our sankara seem very prominent and real. But actually, of course, they're just um, phony, uh, just things that we make up. We're just groping around. Everybody is kind of faking it, you know? <laughs> but when we meditate and we come to base our consciousness on the void, that's the real thing because that never goes away and never changes. And why do you call Sankara fabrications? Because they fabricate fabricated things. Thus, they are called fabrications. What do they fabricate as a fabricated thing? For the sake of form, they fabricate form as a fabricated thing. For the sake of feeling, they fabricate feeling as a fabricated thing. For the sake of consciousness, they fabricate consciousness as a fabricated thing. Because they fabricate fabricated things, they are called fabrications. One of the meanings of the English word fabrication is a lie, isn't it? Somebody was called to testify and they presented so many fabrications. Uh, and thus they were judged to be in contempt or whatever. <laughs> so a fabrication is a false front. So here the Buddha is saying that even consciousness is fabricated. And why is that? Well, one of the terms that talks about or describes Nibbana is Sabha Sankara Samato. Remember? Etam Sankam Etam Panitam Yadidam Sabha Sankara Samato. Right? And then there is Sabu Patinisago Tanhakayo, Virago Nirodo, and, and so many more. There's a list of something, something like 23 different terms that actually refer to Nibbana. So the term Nibbana and all terms are mind-made. They're fabricated. Try to understand. They're symbols. They're pointers, like in computer software. Huh? You can have a pointer to something else, like a data structure or something, or another, another routine in a computer program. So instead of manipulating the, the thing itself, you can just manipulate the pointer. It's like a symbol. Uh, it's like a word. A word is just a pointer to a phenomenon. That's all. Uh, so the problem with us is we think these things are real. <laughs> we ascribe permanence to them, but they're not permanent and they're not real. They're abstractions, symbols. So we get in trouble because we think we base our consciousness, we base our reality on things that aren't actually real. So the target or goal of all this meditation and spiritual life is Nibbana which simply means the complete relinquishment or cessation of clinging or grasping things that aren't real, that aren't permanent. And so we get ourselves in trouble. So as, as long as we think that, oh, I have to attain Nibbana, I have to attain enlightenment, I have to attain self-realization, huh? 
That's a Sankara. And because the Sankara are active, we're thinking this all the time, right? It might even be our whole identity. You know, people put on robes and all kinds of other religious symbols. As, and then they, they strut around as, oh, I'm the big sadhu, you know. <laughs> so actually, this is a sankhara. And because the sankhara are active, they cannot attain enlightenment. They cannot attain liberation or nibbana. See, this is how deceptive the mind is. So this is the problem. An uninstructed, run-of-the-mill person assumes Sankara to be the self, or the self as possessing Sankara, or Sankara as in the self, or the self as in Sankara. Those Sankara tear away from him, and so from that cause he would come to disaster. He assumes consciousness to be the self, or the self as possessing consciousness or consciousness as in the self, or the self as in consciousness. That consciousness tears away from him. And so from that cause, he would come to disaster. Here the Buddha is making a simile, an example, of a man who falls into the river during the rainy season, during a raging flood, and he's swept away by the current. And so he's trying to save himself, right? So he's grasping all these different things, branches and grass and things that are growing on the side of the river or rocks, you know. But the branches and grass aren't strong enough to hold him. They tear away. Huh? Or the rocks are slippery with moss. And so he gets torn away from the rocks and swept away by the current helplessly. So this is the state of a person who thinks that Sankara or conditioned consciousness is going to save him. And so he, he grasps them, he clings to them, he holds on to them, establishes his consciousness on them, especially on words, names, name and forms. And we'll get into that really deeply when we go into the uh, name and form which is the next stage after consciousness. So because he is trying to grasp these things that are fragile, that are only impermanent, only temporary, uh, therefore he is swept away by the current of life and there's nothing he can do about it. So the problem is Sankara and consciousness both are dependently arisen. And what is consciousness? These six classes of consciousness, eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, body consciousness, intellect consciousness. This is called consciousness. That pleasure and happiness arise in dependence on consciousness. That is the allure of consciousness. That consciousness is inconstant, stressful, subject to change. That is the drawback of consciousness. Subduing desire and passion for consciousness, abandoning desire and passion for consciousness, that is the escape from consciousness. So most of us are trapped in consciousness. And all these things Buddha is saying, huh? we think that consciousness is the self, or it's in the self, or the self is in consciousness. Don't we all think like that? See, these are all subjects for meditation and contemplation. You know, some t sometimes people ask, why don't you give any meditation methods? But actually, everything we talk about is a meditation method. But you have to see how to apply it in your own life, in your own consciousness. So conditioned consciousness is a combination of the senses, the sense objects, and the awareness of them based on our native unconditioned awareness. See, But because we're trying to establish consciousness on the senses or the sense objects, then we get in trouble. 
They are not stable. They're impermanent. Uh, they're dukkha. They're unsatisfactory. And they're not self. So we're trying to make them permanent, enjoyable, and self. So is there a problem, Houston? <laughs> yes, there is a problem. The problem is we're trying to make something what it's not. As a young woman or a young man who likes adornment, looking at the reflection of her or his face in a clean mirror or in a bowl of clear water would be seeing dependent on it, not independently. In this way, Ananda, dependent on Sankara arises the notion, I am, not independently. Dependent on consciousness arises the notion, I am, not independently. So when one, when one grasps a mirror, uh, one sees one's reflection dependent on the mirror. Well, what happens when the mirror breaks? See? So if we try to establish our feeling of I am on something temporary, when that temporary thing breaks, when it changes or ceases, or disappears, then we're at a loss. Then we're suffering. Huh? We have a problem. So the, the secret is to let go, to drop all this clinging, all this identification, and base our consciousness on the void alone. This is the problem. Remember, we went over last time. Sense desire is your first battalion. The second is called dejection. Hunger and thirst make up the third, and craving is called the fourth. So, according to this sutta, there are four kinds of sankhara, and these are called the armies of death. Why? Because if we follow them, if we invest in them, if we become identified with them, uh, sense pleasures and so on, they lead us on the path of death and rebirth. And so round and round the wheel of samsara. And the whole trick is to get free from them. They're all only thoughts. Try to understand. Simply thoughts. So they can be controlled. How are they controlled? By contemplation of Paticca Samuppada. And this is why we're going over it. What was the Buddha meditating on when he attained enlightenment? Paticca Samuppada. It's described that the first watch of the night, he contemplated in the forward direction. And the second watch of the night, he contemplated in the reverse direction. And in the third watch of the night, he contemplated in both forward and reverse simultaneously. And so this is what he was working on. And in the morning, when the morning star arose and gradually faded in the advancing dawn, he attained. So <laughs> why don't people tell, tell us these things, huh? Do they think we're so stupid that we can't understand dependent arising? No, I think it's that they're so stupid that they can't understand it. <laughs> because they have received it in a didactic, dogmatic, religious kind of fanatical way. With no real understanding, no real experience behind it. But if you sit there and you go through Paticca Samuppada in order, huh? Let's see, from ignorance, sankhara arise. From sankhara, consciousness arises, and so on. And then you see the reverse order. Oh, with the fading out of ignorance, then sankhara cease as well. And from cessation of sankhara, conditioned consciousness also ceases. And you meditate on this, and you observe it in your own self, in your own mind. This is the key to enlightenment. Buddha Sarnai.